Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. So, <clears throat> we are going to continue, get right into the hadith. Um, we finished Bab Umur al-Iman. Um, so just a quick recap um, of just the topics, not the recap of the content. This is Kitab al-Iman of Sahih al-Bukhari. The first chapter was Bab al-Iman wa qawli nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam buni al-islam wa la khams. So this chapter, Imam, uh, Imam al-Bukhari laid out his vision of what Iman is, what a grand idea Iman is, and with uh, a lot of verses from Quran and Athar. And then the main hadith was the hadith of Islam being built upon five pillars. And then the second chapter was Bab umur al-Iman, the more matters pertaining to Iman, and we saw that last week. Now we continue with the third chapter. Um, so, Nadim, Faliyat al-Fadl. Um, Bab al-Muslimu man salim al-Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadihi. Haddathana Adamu ibn Abi Iyas. Qala, haddathana Shu'ba an Abdullahi ibn Abi, Abi, Abi al-Safar wa Ismail an Sha'bi an Abdullah ibn Sha'bi an Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu an an Nabi sallallahu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala al muslimu man salim al muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadihi wal muhajiru man hajara ma naha naha Allahu an Okay stop here we'll read this now after we're done with the hadith Okay so this is uh, so the hadith now are going to be very basic and they're well understood that they don't need much in way of commentary but we there's much to learn from the asanid so this chapter uh, is the next chapter and it's entitled uh, bab al muslimu man salim al muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadihi the muslim is the one from whose um, tongue in hands, other Muslims are protected. So, Hadathana Adam ibn Abiyah. So, the, well, let's do the hadith and I'll come back to the isnad. So, the isnad, uh, the hadith is Al Muslimu man salim al Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadihi. And that's part of the chapter heading. So, the Muslim is the one from whose hand and from whose tongue other Muslims are protected. Wal muhajiru man hajara ma naha Allahu anhu. And the muhajir is the one who leaves what Allah has forbidden. So when you read, sorry, Bukhari always relate to what we're talking about. This is Kitab al-Iman. So we're talking about Iman. What is Iman? That grand nature of Iman. Not something simple, just like beliefs, but something much bigger, much grander, so much weightier. And so we learned that Islam and Iman are related. When you have Iman, Islam comes next. Impossible to have Islam without Iman. They are strongly, strongly connected. Here we're learning how is you're dealing with others. Now the ideas coming are now is moving beyond personal and now dealing with others. So if you believe in Allah, you love him, you trust him, then the implication, the teaching here is you must necessarily be kind to his creation. Because, you know, uh, Muslim is the one, your tongue does not hurt that other person. And your hand does not hurt from the other person. From your persona, your tongue and your hands, everyone is safe. So this is very, very important. So um, so the Muslim being used here is literally Muslim. But as you can see, this whole is Kitab al-Iman, this whole chapter. So when Allah talks about Islam, he also means Iman. When he talks about, so these, you have to understand that this, this is normal function of language. So this hadith does not necessarily mean only Muslims does not mean that as, as believers we're allowed to harm others with their tongue if they're not Muslim. So the meaning is not that Muslims don't harm other Muslims, but we harm non-Muslims. No. Nothing can be farther from the truth. If you look in the commentary what scholars say, sometimes a general word is used and the meaning is specific. Sometimes specific word is used, but the meaning is more general. So this, is this hadith speaking about Iman or Mu'min, the believers? Yes, but the word used is Muslim. So that's how language works. So here, um, it means much more. The, the Muslim 
i.e. the one who has iman and that iman leads him to Islam, worship and, and obedience, is not allowed to hurt anyone without justification, of course. And that applies to even non-Muslims. So the right understanding here, this applies to everyone because the word is just used as an example. It's not meant to be only uh, specific to Muslim. Now, um, the second portion is about hijrah. So this is a great teaching style of the Prophet ﷺ where he took a word and he would explain its meaning from a spin-off of the word. And we do that in our speeches and khutbahs, even in English. So that's just an interesting way of speaking, keeps people's attention. Um, so he says, Al-Muhajir wal-Muhajiru man hajara ma Allahu an. The real muhajir, the real person who makes hijrah, is the one who leaves off what Allah has forbidden. You make hijrah from that which Allah has forbidden. So there's all this talk about, people ask questions about hijrah, and now there's a revival of hijrah today, um, or interest in hijrah at least. Well, my friends, uh, my generation, the last few days, that's a real consideration again, because the world is on fire, things are getting very intense, and Allah protect all of us, but it looks very scary the way uh, things are turning out, and the future looks very scary. So hijrah has always been a real possibility for believers throughout our history, although that hijrah with a capital H ended with al-fatr, ended when the Muslims united the Arabian Peninsula. Um, but prior to that, every Muslim had to make hijrah. That would never happen again, but hijrah as a concept, the real hijrah of, of leaving your home, um, it's it's always been an operation. And ask any ask the Palestinians today. Most of them are, you know, muhajirun from their own land, kicked out, sometimes by force, sometimes it's voluntarily. And now there's a whole population of Gaza being the the strategy of Israel is to have them just leave, go to these humanitarian corridors into the Sinai. You think they'll ever come back? You think they'll ever allow them to come back? Of course not. That's what they did in the whole country. It was always, okay, leave your home temporarily, but then they, you never come back. So they're trying to uh, enforce a forced exodus, and that is hijrah. So, so hijrah is a real concept, but also every single Muslim has to do hijrah because all of us have to avoid, avoid what Allah has forbidden. So the technique of the Prophet was use the word itself to teach you a meaning, to give you the broader meaning of the word. Um, so the muhajir, is the one who leaves and makes hijrah from everything that Allah has forbidden. So there's a great hadith about not, har not, har not harming others. In any society, peace and security lies in submitting to uh, law and order. So following the law, to, so to speak, not harming others. That's how you live in a neighborhood. If your place where you live is not safe like the Palestinians, that's not a life. Like they're in their own home, but it's an open air prison because they're not safe. They're always being bombed. They're always they they can't leave. They can't import export. Their water supply is shut off whenever the enemy feels like. So that's not a life. So that's so real life. Allah is trying to teach us. The Prophet taught us how to live life, and this is what a believer is. Believer does not harm others. From their tongue and their hand, others are always safe. There's a beautiful meaning, and it's a beautiful hadith. Now coming to the isnad. So the isnad chart. Who is the teacher of Imam al-Bukhari? Who? Adam ibn Abi Iyas. Adam ibn Abi Iyas. So, who was Adam ibn Abi Iyas? Um, Bismillah. So, Adam ibn Abi Iyas was one of the teachers of Bukhari, um, and he was from Asqalan. Asqalan is what happened on October 7th. So, that's where these fighters supposedly invaded Asqalan and they kidnapped people from there and they killed people there. So this is at the center of the conflict. So, um, you know, this is a great I mean, coincidence and sign of Allah. These places, these regions were ours from the very beginning. Imam Bukhari's teacher was from Palestine, from, from Asqalan. It wasn't called Palestine. It was called Sham at that time. So his name was Adam ibn Abi Yas al-Asqalani. And... Although he was he was of Khurasani origin, he was raised in Baghdad, but he settled in Asqalan. So that tells you when you read these biographies how universal Muslims were. Um, 
you know, he was raised in Isfahan, so he's Persian origin. Uh, no, he was born in Isfahan, Persian origin. His family is from Khurasan, raised in Baghdad, and then eventually settled in Sham. Um, you know, this is, Hijra is a part of life for believers, for all, the, it's always been like that. Um, he was known, he was a, one of the experts of, of that region. He was one of the more senior teachers of Imam al-Bukhari. When Ibn Hajar classifies his teachers according to stages, um, Adam ibn Abiyaz falls under tier two of his teachers in terms of seniority. Why? Because he narrated from minor followers. So he's atba'u tabirin. From Bukhari's teachers, the major ones are those who narrated from the tabirin. But then there were some teachers who narrated from the minor tabirin. So that would make Bukhari generation four. So he was one of his more senior teachers. Um, he's one of the 20 prolific teachers of Bukhari. So when you, I'll always share that fact. If, if one of the teachers is from the 20, remember what did I say about the 20? There are 20 teachers of Bukhari from whom he takes the majority, more than half of the Sahih. And Adam ibn Abi Yas is one of them. So it shows you how much Bukhari relied upon him. Uh, Imam al dhahbi describes him as the following, Al-Imam al hafiz Al-Qudwa, the great expert, the Hafid, the role model, uh, Shaykh al-Sham, Abu al-Hasan al-Khurasani al-Marwadi. He was called Shaykh al-Sham, the, the, the great scholar of that region, Palestine and Sham and the Levant. Thumma al-Baghdadi, Thumma al-Asqalani, Muhaddith Asqalan. He was known as the Muhaddith of Asqalan the muhaddith of the city of Asqalan. So he was, his grading, Abu Hatim said, Thiqa ma'moon muta'abbad min khiyar ibadillah ta'ala. He was thiqa, fully reliable, trustworthy, ma'moon protected from bid'ah, muta'abbad, someone who worshipped uh, very uh, intensely, he was known for his piety and worship, min khiyari ibadillah, from the best of Allah's slaves. Uh, Imam Nasai says, "La ba'sa bihi." You can't take from him. There's no problem with him. So, only Bukhari relates from him, and Muslim does not. Um, so, Muslim uh, probably because he did not get the chance to meet him, but Bukhari relates from him uh, abundantly in his Sahih, and he died in the year 220. So, Adam ibn Abi, Abi Iyas, the Muhaddith of Asqalan, is Bukhari's teacher here. Now he narrates from, who's the next person going up the chain? Shorba. So Shorba is an amazing scholar. We mention him again and again. We mention him in class two of Hadith 101, I believe, because <clears throat> he is a central figure in Hadith. He was a prominent scholar, uh, Hadith expert of Iraq. He was the first one to earn the title Amir al-Mu'mineen fil Hadith. Amir al-Mu'mineen fil Hadith because of his expertise and his knowledge. Uh, when he died, Sufyan al-Thawri said about him, <clears throat> Sufyan al-Thawri is the one who named him Amir al-Mu'mineen fil Hadith. He says today Hadith has died because he held him in high esteem. He was someone so prominent in Hadith circles. He's the real founder of the science of ilal or criticism. So if you look at, uh, if you do grading of hadith, look at ilm al-rijal, um, looking at isnads, and this whole science was begun by Imam al-Shu'ba. Uh, prior to him, it was begun by Imam Malik, and so, but formalized by Imam al-Shu'ba, and then continued by the likes of Imam Ahmad Ali al ibn al-Madini, and then Imam al-Bukhari, uh, and onward. He was born in the year 82 of the Hijri calendar, it was, um, he's described as being born with a speech impediment. He had a lath. He had a speech impediment, but did not stop him from learning and being at such a high level in the field of hadith. He was born in southern Iraq near the city of Wasif, and he settled in Basra early on. He studied fiqh with Anas ibn Malik, and he studied fiqh with Hassan al Basri. Um, his father was a former slave who died while he was very young. And his mother is the one who edged him to study hadith, much like their parallels between him and Imam al-Bukhari. They're both orphans, and both of their mothers are the ones who pushed them to study hadith. Um, 
for instance, he says once he was a young boy and his mother took him to a village. There was an old lady by the name of Shumesa, uh, Um Salama. And he said, go learn from this old lady because she has, she was a student of Aisha, radiallahu anha. So he spent some time with her um, and he devoted himself after that to knowledge. And one of the interesting things about him is he never worked in his life and he was poor. He lived a simple life. He avoided luxuries. But how did he support himself? His three brothers, they worked and they were wealthy and they gave him money. So he lived off his family. And it shows you there are individuals like that. You know, if you, if he had he been working or been forced to provide a livelihood for his family, he would probably not have reached the station that he reached. And so that's something, uh, you know, keep in mind that many of these uh, scholars were able to do what they did because they either inherited wealth like Imam Bukhari or they had wealthy family that sponsored them um, and allowed them to do what they did. And that's something amazing that there's something we find in the hadith of the Prophet as well. And imagine the reward that all these family members share. Um, so he avoided luxuries and worldly life. Um, and, you know, there's an incident once he saw one of his students said, once I was sitting in the class of Shorba and I happened to wear a new shirt that day. And Shorba asked me how much I paid for it. And he said, I bought it. I told him I bought it for eight dirhams. And Shorba said to him, do you not fear Allah? You walk around with a shirt that costs that much. It would have been much better for you to buy a shirt for much less and give the rest to the poor. So it's the same ideas we find today, you know, like, you know, in our families, we have the same conversations. So it's so interesting. He was very, very generous despite being poor. Um, in fact, the young children in the poor areas used to call him father. Why? Because he used to give charity regularly despite being poor. And there's something amazing that poverty does not prevent people from charity. You're always, everyone's in a position to do something or to give. Um, and that's not an excuse. Sometimes you find the poorest people are the most generous. Um, so his student says, uh, Abu Walid, that I have never seen a man more generous than Shorba ibn al-Hajjaj. So he discovered hadith after his mother pushed him in that direction, and he traveled widely for it. He came to Medina, and who was teaching, who do you think was teaching Medina when he came? Um, it was Imam Malik, uh, rahimullah. Although Shorba is the same generation as Malik, but older than Malik. Malik was younger than him. Shorba was uh, older, but yet he sat and studied with Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala. And then after that, he continued teaching hadith for the rest of his life. And he became very renowned. Um, in fact, he came to Baghdad uh, to teach hadith, and he had a 40-day hadith dictation session. So he taught hadith for 40 days, and every single day he taught 100 hadith, 100 hadith a day. And there are many scholars that attend those sessions and they relate from him and they say, this is, I learned from Shorba when he came to Baghdad. Um, so Imam Ahmad said about him, Kana ummatan wahdahu fi shan. He was an entire nation unto himself in this field of hadith and hadith criticism. So Shorba is a renowned scholar. Now, who is the person above him? Ab Abdullah ibn Abi Safar. Abdullah ibn Abi Safar. So Abdullah ibn Abi Safar, his full name was Abdullah ibn Sa'id ibn Yuhmid of Kufa. So his father, Abu Safar, was a great jurist and student of great companions, a tabari. And they were both reliable, father and son. So we don't know exactly when he died, roughly around the year 126. He died during the reign of Marwan ibn Muhammad, who was the last of the Umayyads. So Yahya ibn Ma'in said, Abdullah ibn Abi Safar was thiqa. He was reliable. And all six books of hadith relate from him except for Tirmidhi. So his hadith appear in all the books except for Tirmidhi. And then he relates from who? Why Ismail? Okay, so that's two. He relates from two teachers. He relates from Ismail ibn Abi Khalid of Kufa. Ismail ibn Abi Khalid of Kufa. So first briefly about him his name was abu abdullah ismail ibn abi khalid al-balji al-bajli 
He was a Tabari, Hadith expert of Kufa. He's one of the great experts of Kufa along with Armash. Some say he was even better than Armash. He heard from five companions, so he later Hadith from five companions, and the rest of his teachers were Tabirin. Sufyan Thori held him in high regard. Um, Sufyan Thori used to say, Khufadunna Thalatha. The experts among people are three. Ismail ibn Abi Khalid, who was him, wa Abdul Malik ibn Abi Sulaiman, wa Yahya ibn Sa'id al Ansari, wa Ismail Alamun Nas. Um, so he, wa Ismail Alamun Nas, bi Sharbi, wa Athbatuhum fihi, la uqaddim alayhi ahadan. So Ismail was one of the experts of his region, and he's the best student, one of the best students of Sharbi, and Sharbi we're going to look at next. So Ismail ibn Abi Khalid, um, Imam Ahmad said about him, Asahu nas hadithan ani Sharbi ibn Abi Khalid. He said he's the most reliable among the students of Sharbi in his hadith. He was trustworthy, Yahya ibn Ma'in deemed him a thiqa. And um, Muhammad al Mausli said about him, Hujjatun, Ida lam yakun Ismail hujja, faman yakun hujja. If he is a proof upon people, if he is not to be relied upon, then there is no one to be relied upon. That's Ismail ibn Abi Khalid. And the second of his teachers is Sharbi, right? Sharbi. So where does it say Wa? Let me find the hadith. Oh no, okay. So Ismail is a teacher of Shorba, and Abdullah ibn Abi Saib is a teacher of Shorba. So he did it right. But you need to draw a line from uh, Shorba to Ismail, and then both of them are students of, of Sharbi. So I think you wrote the same name twice, Shorba, and then one is Sharbi, Sharbi. So that brings us to Imam Sharbi. So Imam Sharbi is a great Imam. You have to know him in Hadith as well. So two great names here, Shorba. He's a must know, and so he's Imam Sharbi. Uh, his his name was Amir, Abu Amr Amir ibn Sharahil. So he was the chief judge of Kufa. He was a great hadith expert. He was a contemporary of Ibrahim and Nakhari. Um, and he's a teacher of Abu Hanifa. He related from many many companions. Imam Sharbi. He said himself, "Adraktu khamsu miati sahabi." I have met 500 of the companions of the Prophet and He was the one known for many things. We, we did mention him um, incidentally in many uh, portions of our hadith courses. One of the things about him is that he's the one who had the prodigal memory. Um, he said uh, himself, Ma katabtu sawda'a fi bayda'a ila yawmi hadha. Remember I asked you what this statement meant? He said, I never put black on white in my life which means he never put ink on paper in his lifetime because he had a prodigal memory. He said, وَلَا حَدَّثَنِي رَجُلٌ بِحَدِيثٍ قَطْ إِلَّا حَفِظْتُهُ No person has ever related hadith to me except that I immediately memorized it. And he said, وَلَا أَحْبَبْتُ أَنْ يُعِيدَهُ عَلَيَّ And I never liked for anyone to repeat a sentence to me again. You know how some students say, can you go back to that slide? <laughs> oh. Imam Zuhri was like that. Uh, Imam Malik was like that. Imam Sharbi was like that. Like Imam Malik also, like Zuhri, related 30 hadith to him and he asked him to repeat 15. And um, Zuhri said to Malik, Yeah, Malik, you know, I have never asked any of my teachers to repeat anything in my life. That's harder for me than to move a mountain. So, you know, not everyone has that ability, but there are certain individuals that have that ability and he was one of them. He was born in the reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab and he saw many, many companions and and he became an expert. People used to say about him, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا أَعْلَمُ مِنَ الشَّعْبِ I have not seen, Makul said about him, I have not seen anyone more knowledgeable than Sha'bi. Ibn Sirin, Muhammad ibn Sirin, the great scholar, he advised one of his students, he said, um, إِلْزَمْ الشَّعْبِ فَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُهُ يَسْتَفْتِي وَأَصْحَابُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ تَوَافِرُونَ He said to his student, 
find Sharbi and stick with him because I have seen him teaching and issuing fatawa when so many companions were still alive and available. So he was so knowledgeable that the companions had him teach and allowed him to teach and people learned from him despite companions being around him. Um, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, the hadith of the Haram, he said, Ulama unnas thalatha. The scholars among people are three. Ibn Abbas fi zamanihi, wa Sharbi fi zamanihi, wa Thawri fi zamanihi. The three great scholars of their time. Ibn Abbas in his time, Sharbi in his time, and Thawri, Sufyan Thawri in his time. This tells you all these names should not be random names, but some should be above the rest. When you have statements like this, fi zamani, that means this particular individual was a cut above the rest. Um, so he had many, many great qualities and, um, you know, he was a great scholar, a great, you know, someone asked him, and I'll end with that. They asked him, Qila um, li min aina laka kullu hadha al-ilm. From where do you get all this knowledge from? People are so amazed and uh, by him. They said, where do you get all this knowledge from? Or how do you get all this knowledge? He said, بِنَّفْيَ الْإِغْتِمَامِ وَالسَّيْرُ فِي الْبِلَادِ وَالصَّبْرِ كَصَبْرِ الْحَمَامِ وَبُكُورِ كَبُكُورِ الْغُرَابِ He said, these are the qualities I live my life with. He said, first, نَفْيَ um, الْإِغْتِمَامِ You know, he says, by denying the pleasures of this life, I believe that's what that means. بِنَّفْيَ الْإِغْتِمَامِ Denying, you know, your the pursuits of your soul. وَالسَّيْرُ فِي الْبِلَادِ Traveling widely. He used to travel widely to learn. Was sabr and now and uh, sabr persistence ka sabr al hamam, like the persistence of the doves or the pigeons. So in ancient times we were connected to nature. There are a lot of qualities that are associated with animals, and they don't make sense today because we no longer follow that. But like anyone who's growing up in your regions, the poetry that you learn, for instance, in India and Pakistan. A lot of the poetry of Iqbal is about the birds and the spider and what the deer said to this animal. Animals were known to have qualities. There were books written, Kitab al Haywanat, and things like that. Aesop's Fables, right? That's a book of animals speaking to one another. So that was even part of other traditions. So, Sabr ka Sabr al Hamam, the so persistence and patience like the doves and the pigeons. Finally, wa Bukur ka Bukur al Ghurab. Bukur, what do you think that means? Gurab are, are crows, or you can extrapolate to birds. But bukur. Huh? Yeah, getting up early. Bukur is being an early bird, like the early bird, even in English. It has the bird in the... In the so it's the same thing in Arabic. Bukur ka bukur il gurab. Being early like the early birds. That's the translation. So these are the qualities that made Sharbi so famous. Uh, and so renowned in his in, in his status and his nature. So this is a great hadith with the great isnad. You learn a lot by looking at the isnad. Now, if Nadim is still with us, you want to finish the rest of the isnad. There's the hadith continues and it says what? Okay, he's tending to his. Yep, newborn. sorry. No, 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 he's not here yet. I'm here. I'm back. Qala Abu Abdullah wa qala Abu Muawiyah haddathana Dawood an Amir qala sami'tu Abdullah an al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa qala Abdul A'la an Dawood an Amir an Abdullah an al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, good. When you read an, it's a, it's a preposition, so the next word takes genitive case, or majru, right? So it's an abdillah, ani nabiyyi, so na abdullah, so in Arabic. Um, so, and then, so I didn't mention, Shabi relates from who? Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. So I didn't mention the companion, but the companion needs to be mentioned. I told you I'm not going to do biographies of the companions, or those are widely available. But this was the great companion, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, the son of Amr ibn al-As. So, um, so there's something about the Isnad that we need to mention, and that is that 
this is not has two um, unique features. Um, well, no. Okay. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As, he was the son of Amr ibn al As, and he was the one who said himself that I wrote down 1,000 hadith from the Prophet in his lifetime. So he's the one who disproves the idea that hadith was written down 200 years or like a generation after the Prophet because he was the one who had a sahifa. There's sahifa Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As. Um, so he wrote down hadith in the lifetime of the Prophet great companion and uh, Abu Huraira used to complain that Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As has more hadith than me because he used to write them down and I didn't write them down so that's Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As so now in the second half sometimes after the hadith the hadith ended but there's some comments that are continuing so what's happening here and this is something you need to learn so after that it says Qala Abu Abdullah so what does that mean, Qala Abu Abdullah? So who's Abu Abdullah? Who do you think that is? It could be anybody because everyone has a son named Abdullah almost. All right. So, but here, what do you think? What do you think this could be referring to? Obviously, it has to be someone that we were dealing with, not just a random person. Why would they quote Abu Abdullah at the end? What do you think? Abdullah ibn Amr? Who? Okay, that's a good guess. Yeah, it could be. But then it would be more obvious. Like then they would probably use the same name they mentioned in the Isnad. So so if had it been someone from the Isnad, probably it would make more sense to just mention that name because they already mentioned that name. Why didn't they use the Kunya earlier? So who is Abu Abdullah here? And this is very important hadith. You have to know the Kunyas. No. I mean, he might have had the kunya, but that's not what it means here. Like, so when you have a hadith, so the hadith begins with haddathana. Haddathana. So, who's speaking? So you have to understand, like, when you're reading this text, starting with haddathana, who's saying these words? Bukhari. No, this is Sahil Bukhari. Look. Abdullah bin Amr is saying in the middle, but I'm saying from Hadathan. That's why I said Hadathana from the beginning. Who's actually saying these words? It's Bukhari. Bukhari is a speaker. So when you have like the hadith ends, because it's very clear what's happening in the beginning, right? Hadathana, qala, an. Bukhari is quoting his isnad. And within the isnad, there are quotes, right? But the whole isnad, the whole text goes back to Bukhari. But then. When you're done with the text, and then it says Qala Abu Abdullah. When you see you say you see the same thing, and when you read Tirmidhi, what does it say after the hadith? Qala what? In Tirmidhi, what does it say? Something similar. Huh? No. Well, they'll say that too, but usually every hadith is Qala. At the end of the hadith, there's a Abu Isa. Abu Isa. So that's the author. So Abu Isa is Tirmidhi, so Abu Abdullah is Bukhari. Abu Abdullah is Bukhari. So when you see Qala Abu Abdullah, not in part of the Isnad, get out of the Isnad, now you're, this is not in the Isnad anymore, now you're starting something new. In Mu'allaqat or in the chapter headings or after a hadith ends, when you have Qala Abu Abdullah, it means Bukhari. So this is Bukhari speaking, it's very important to recognize that. Same thing in, in Tirmidhi, when you're reading Tirmidhi after the hadith ends, it says Qala Abu Isa. And Abu Isa is Tirmidhi giving more comments. So this is Bukhari telling you something else about the hadith or the isnad. So, and the hadith ends at the next bab, right? So before, so there's more things going on now. Now Bukhari is speaking. So, Qala Abu Abdullah. Qala Abu Abdullah. So then he says what? Qala, wa, uh, qala Abu Abdullah wa Qala Abu Muawiyah. Hadathana Dawood. So Bukhari is saying Qala Abu Muawiyah. Abu Muawiyah says Hadathana Dawood. Dawood relates to us. An Amir. From Amir. Amir is the other name of Sharbi, right? The real name of Sharbi. So Qal and Amir says Samir to Abdullah. Abdullah and in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So he gives you another isnad here. That's what's happening. The second isnad is from Abu Muawiyah, from Dawood, from Sharbi, from Abdullah, Ibn Amr ibn al As. Okay, so, and then what's the hadith? It doesn't say the hadith. Waqala Abdul Ala. Now he gives you another isnad. So, what hadith are they talking about? Which hadith do you think they're talking about? The same hadith, yeah. So he's giving you another isnad for the same hadith. That's what's happening here. So if you make another tree, um, it would be helpful to make another tree. Um, the tree would be Abu Muawiyah from his teacher Dawood from Sharbi. If you can, uh, yeah, just from uh, Sharbi down here. So make uh, Dawood coming out of Sharbi and then Abu Muawiyah under him. So, but no, that's Shorba. Uh, no, that's Sharbi, yes. You have to change the name Sharbi. Yeah. Dawood here going to Shorba. Uh, you mixing me up the way you wrote this now. <laughs> going to Sharbi. Okay. So, what's happening here is he's giving another Isnad with the same hadith. So, now this is very important. Why would he be doing that? That's the important question here. You might say, well, random. Nothing's random in these books. There has to be a reason for everything. We don't use Rabiul's language. Yeah, under him is Abu Muawiyah. Uh, under, under. So this way. So Abu Muawiyah begins. Abu Muawiyah is, takes it from Dawood. He started from the top, from Bukhari. Oh, so that's what you're doing. I'm reading this way. So that's why, okay, I see. I see, okay. Yes, then it'll be top, yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So if you put another isnad for the same hadith, it's something, it's, it's for an effect, it's to bolster the isnad, to make it stronger. What does that mean? Two different routes to make it stronger, but why do you need to make it stronger? So there must be some problem in that you need to make it stronger. That's the point. When Not every hadith has that. Like in the previous hadith, we did not see that. So first of all, who was Abu? Let's maybe tell you about Abu Muawiyah. Abu Muawiyah was um, a great hadith expert of Kufa. He died in the year 194. He was one of the best students of Armash, having spent 20 years with him. So Ahmad says he's Abu. Uh, Imam Ahmad says about him. Um, Abu Muawiyah fi ghairi hadith al Armash muttarib la yahfaduha hifdan jayidan. Abu Muawiyah is good with the hadith of Armash, but other than Armash, he's not the best. He did not preserve their hadith very well. And so he was a great student of Armash, but he was not such a good student of others. Um, and also another thing about him, um, oh, Ibn Hibban says this, He was a great expert, proficient. وَلَكِنَّهُ كَانَ مُرْجِئًا خَبِيثًا he was a murja'a from this group called the murja'a, the people you know who believe action and uh, um, iman is not linked at all. The murja'a would be against this whole chapter, Kitabul Iman. They believe iman has nothing to do with actions. So he was among those. Um, so Abu Dawood said, "Kana ra'isul murja'a bil kufa." He was the head of the murja'a in Kufa. So again, that same theme I keep telling you: Imam Bukhari is not afraid to take from everyone. As long as he feels the information is sound. So he has a different, more academic approach. when there's something that's very relevant for us today. Even someone could be from a group. You don't eliminate everything they do entirely. So Imam Bukhari is taking from Abu Muawiyah. Harun al-Rashid uh, held him in high esteem. He was blind. But he was known for, for great knowledge and expertise. And um, But Harun al-Rashid, for instance, he used to invite him to the palace. And he was once, they said, they saw Harun Rashid pour water with his own hands to have him wash his hands without him knowing who it was. That's how much he held him in esteem. So he was a great scholar, great expert, but um, was accused of, so he, he wasn't the most reliable in all the hadith. And also he was uh, part of this heresy of Irja. So he relates from Dawood, uh, Ibn Abi Hind, so his full name was Dawood ibn Abi Hind Dinar. 
who died in the year 140. So, so Abu Muawiyah is not a teacher of Bukhari. So there's a lot of things you need to learn here. It's because Bukhari says, Qala Abu Muawiyah. Bukhari doesn't say, Hadathana Abu Muawiyah. So realize that when Bukhari says, Qala, he's just quoting a scholar somewhere up and with his Isnad. So he bypasses his link to that person. Although he has a link to that person, he bypasses it. What would you call this hadith? When you bypass your own teacher, you just quote directly, huh? What is this type of hadith called? So it's a hadith where you're quoting a hadith but without an isnad. So it's kind of like hanging. Mu'allaq. This is mu'allaq. This is one of the mu'allaqat of Bukhari. This is what we mean when we say mu'allaqat Bukhari. So sometimes it comes in the chapter heading, sometimes it comes within the body, right, after a hadith. But anytime Bukhari says, qala such and such, such and such said, without quoting his full isnad. Now, you might be confused by when he says, qala Abu Muawiyah, and Abu Muawiyah gives his isnad. So he quotes a partial isnad. But the beginning from Bukhari to that is Abu Muawiyah, there's no isnad. So this is one of the mu'allaq hadith in Bukhari. So he reports this isnad just for a purpose. So Dawood ibn Abi Hind um, is someone who saw Anas ibn Malik uh, and he was someone who's known for his piety and, and he was Imam Ahmad, Imam Nasai, um, all of them they said he was thiqa, he was reliable. So Imam Bukhari only uses Dawood once. This is the only place you find Dawood in Sahih Bukhari. So this Mu'allaq, so what do we learn from that? The Mu'allaq reports are usually from people who are not fully reliable. Had they been on the primary conditions of Bukhari, they would be in the primary isnad. And Bukhari would not use them in the Mu'allaqat. So generally speaking, although sometimes Bukhari uses an isnad that he quotes elsewhere, but he summarizes in, in the Mu'allaqat. So not every Mu'allaq report is lesser tier sahih or less sound. But sometimes they're weaker reports Bukhari uses to support something. So Bukhari is not quoting that hadith. So you can't say Bukhari quotes a weak isnad here because the main isnad is up there. But there's something there, the reason he's quoting this isnad is for a purpose. And that purpose is the following. Um, if you look at the other isnads, you know, there's a debate over whether um, Sha'bi heard the hadith from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As or not. Sharbi, all the way in the bottom. Sharbi, whether he heard from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As or not. Um, so, although he did meet him, so Imam Muslim does not accept that he heard him. So Imam Muslim does not have this hadith. Only Bukhari does. So Muslim had a difference of opinion. He believed that he did not meet him, so it's not connected from Sharbi. Because why? Why do they say that? Because there is a another Isnad, and these details are in the books of Isnad, where the reporter narrated this same Isnad. When it comes to Sharbi, it says, An Sharbi, An Rajulin, An Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As. They, there's an extra person added between Sharbi and Abdullah. So, therefore, some scholars conclude, well, Sharbi did not hear the hadith directly from Abdullah, so this Isnad is not correct. But now, Bukhari, what is he doing? It's brilliant. He believes it is correct. He believes Shabi did hear from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. So to prove that, he's using this Mu'allaq report. What is the Mu'allaq report saying to you? If you read it, what is it saying? Uh, where are we? Qala Abu Abdullah, Qala Abu Mu'awiyah, Haddathana Dawood, an Amir, Amir al-Shabi, Qal, Samir'tu Abdullah. Now Shabi says, I heard Abdullah. So this Isnad has that additional feature in there where Shabi is saying, I heard Abdullah ibn Abu Malas. For Bukhari, that settles it. So Bukhari is using that to support his potential problem in the Isnad that Shabi might not have heard from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Alas. So that's the reason for this additional report. Um, and then the second Isnad is from Abdul A'la. Um, so the second Isnad comes from Abdul A'la, from Dawood, from Shabi, from Abdullah. So it's the same. Abdul Ala goes to Dawood. So the second one is there just to bolster because, you know, Abu Muawiyah is not the strongest. 
So there's another isnad that supports that. When you have weaker isnad, you can have another weak isnad that could potentially support that. So that's what's happening here. He adds a second isnad to support that first isnad, which is already a supporting isnad. So every single thing that is done is for a purpose. What's the take-home lesson for us? Everything is done for a purpose. It's not meaningless, it's not random. And also this should make you appreciate Bukhari was trying to solve problems. He's trying to understand, he's trying to make judgment calls, and then he's using his expertise to show you why he accepted that hadith and it's fully sound for him. So there's a lot that we can learn and 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 unpack here. And that is that, you know, this science is very complex, it's not very simple. It's not just that Shorba is reliable, Sharbi is reliable, Abdullah is a companion, they're all reliable, reliable, reliable. You still have to investigate whether the reliable person heard from the reliable person or not. So it's not just about the individuals or the names in the chain, but it's also about whether they heard from each other. That's something some people missed. So yes, Ilmu Rijal is also is looking at the names, but also this hadith itself. Did Sharbi and Shorbal, this is not, did it actually reach there in an unconnected way? You could have great, reliable experts, everyone top-notch in the Isnad, but it could be that one of them did not hear from the other. So, you know, that, that is an extra part of the equation that they're looking at. Wallahu a'lam. Okay. That took a little longer than expected. Um, any questions on this hadith? We move on to the next. Yes, just use a mic if you don't mind. Now we have online students. Um... This hadith, uh, we said that the, I think you said Abu Muawiyah is not reliable unless he reports from Amish. So he did for this one? No, he did not. So, so yeah, that's a good point. So he did not. So what's happening here is, despite the fact that he did not, this hadith for Bukhari is acceptable. So he believed he did hear him and he was reliable and he used other support. So that's why he has support. That could be another potential problem in this, not, but... That's why he has a second isnad and a third isnad to support this. When you put it all together for him, this hadith is reliable. So that's that's the whole point about not just looking at the names. Okay, this name is, this person is known to be weak and something. Therefore, we eliminate the hadith. You still have to investigate more. There's much more to this than just a list of names. So, but for, for a Muslim, it's not from Armash and he did not take this isnad. So that's a difference of opinion on this. So just trying to make you appreciate the work that goes in, in these judgments, and what Bukhari is trying to teach us. Okay, Allahu A'lam. Another, another question. The when we get to like Qada Abu Abdullah, um, uh -huh. is that Bukhari saying that? Like he's speaking okay. in third person. So there's a sister that's your soulmate. On I'm not going to mention the name. She says the same. She just typed the same question you asked, exact same question. Um, so that's a good question. So when Bukhari or when Qala Abu Abdullah is there, so there's a great debate among scholars. A lot of people believe it's Bukhari adding that. And similarly in Tirmidhi, Qala Abu Isa. So Bukhari did add those comments to his students. But it's those students that wrote those down. Because when someone speaks about himself, you don't say Qala Abu Abdullah, right? So Qala Abu Abdullah must be someone else speaking, right? Bukhari is a speaker up until here. Now, Qala Abu Abdul, Bukhari said, that means it must have been added. So it got added from Bukhari's work. And Bukhari's, so he was probably dictating and he added those comments. With the students they did, they added those comments in there. And sometimes you'll find variations of that. Uh, so, so it's a good question. Um, did Bukhari mean it to be added here? In all likelihood it did because he, the students are, so how is Sahil Bukhari taught? Bukhari is sitting there, he has hundreds and thousands of students, and he's dictating the hadith to them. In each hadith, he's saying these things, giving them comments. So each student is writing the comments down. So in the Muatta Imam Malik, there are a lot of comments. If you look at all the different students that narrate the Muatta, the comments are very different, because they were sitting in different settings, because Muatta was taught again and again. So that's why sometimes these post-hadith comments might be different in some versions. But generally in Bukhari, they're very similar. It looks like Bukhari is kind of consistent in teaching the same material. Wallahu okay. a'ala. Okay, um, next reader for, let's get someone from the audience here. The next hadith is short. 
So the next bab, the next chapter. So who wants to read? Parshad, you read. Yeah. I'll read the Rivai also or? Bab, from the Bab. Okay. <clears throat> Full. Um, أي إسلامي أفضل حدثنا سعيد بن يحيى بن سعيد القرشي قال حدثنا أبي أبي قال حدثنا أبو بردة ابن عبد الله ابن أبي بردة عن أبي بردة عن أبي موسى رضي الله عنه قال قالوا يا رسول الله أي إف أي الإسلام أفضل قال من سلم المسلمون من لسانه ويده. Okay, that's good. جزاك الله خير. So this hadith is very short. So the isnad, now let's make this not chart. Uh, someone else make this not chart. Um, Musa, why don't you take a shot at it? So for, it's not chart for this second hadith. So the second hadith, uh, first of all, someone asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which Islam is the best? And he said the same thing as the previous hadith. Man salim al-muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadihi. It's the same hadith. But it's a, it's a slightly different answer to a question, which is that whose Islam is the best? Whose Islam is the best? So this is very, very, um, what additional things we learn from here that Islam is just a, not just a one-time thing. You're Muslim and that's it. It's an identity or belonging. No, it's a reality and there are many levels and it's a reality that has different levels of quality, just like Iman goes up and down Islam also. But here, which Islam is the best? In other words, what's the best type of obedience? What's the best Islam that we can achieve? And the Prophet said, if your hands, from your hands and tongue, everyone's safe. You don't harm others. Everyone feels safe uh, around you. So this is very, very important. Um, you know, this is a question that was asked to the Prophet, Ayyul Islam Afdal. And in some versions, Abu Musa, this, the, the companions, Abu Musa al-Ashari. Some versions, Abu Musa is the one asking the question. And this one saying, Qalu, it was said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, which Islam is best. So this is, uh, you know, the companions asking questions, they're so, I mean, someone needs to do research, and this is a great instructive thing. All the questions the companions ask the Prophet, make a list. And then compare them to all the questions that people ask today of the scholars. You'll find it's so different. So the companions, this is what they're concerned with. You know, what Islam is best? How do I make it to paradise? How can I see you, O Messenger of Allah, in Jannah? And how do I do this? So th these are practical questions. They weren't concerned with like minor details, like Bani Israel with the prophets, like, you know, Allah commanded, slaughter a cow. They said, okay, what color, male or female, all these questions. When Allah commands obedience, um, believer is supposed to follow. When Allah commands something and tells you something without leaving the details, that means the details are not meant to be important. But the more you ask about them, then the details come and the matter that's vast becomes more restricted over time. That's what happened with Bani Israel. And that's what's happening with Muslims today. So Islam is very easy. When Allah's messenger said, from your hands and your tongue, others should be safe. That's self-explanatory. The more you delve into details and explain it and define it, it becomes more and more constricted. Something that was meant to be general uh, no longer remains general. And that's the same thing when the Prophet commanded people to pray, to give zakat. You know, the Prophet commanded people to stand up in prayer. Companions did not ask, how should I stand? Where should I put my feet? Where should I put my hands? How far up do I raise my hands? The Prophet said, raise your hands. No companion asked, how far do I raise the hands? Where do I put... They just did it. And because they just did it, that's why there are different details of practice among the companions. The Prophet was okay with that. That's the point. But when you miss the point and you believe that, you know, the whole religion, the purpose of religion is fiqh, and you look for all the details and everything, exact, minute details and everything, then that's something very, very unfortunate. Like, uh, you know, the detail, Allah commands us to slaughter animals, right? For the biha. You slaughter animals. Our people ask so many details, okay, how is, you know, this versus that, and even that is not good enough, and so all these things are not right. Um, Aisha radiallahu anha, Sahih Bukhari, there's a hadith, she came to the Messenger of Allah. She said to him, 
O Messenger of Allah, a lot of people become Muslim, they're new. Then they send us food that contains meat. They just became Muslim. We don't know if they slaughtered properly or not. What should we do with this meat that they send us? What do you think his answer was? And like, look at the answer, also compare the answers we give today. Today the answers will be very different. He said, Kul bismillah wa, uh, kul bismillah wa kul. Say bismillah and eat it. Don't get into the details. What does that mean? That means there's a possibility that some of the meat was not slaughtered correctly and the Prophet allowed Aisha to eat. Did their religion end? Was that a matter of life and death? That you cannot put in your stomach anything that's slaughtered incorrectly? The whole point is you do the best you can, you follow the instructions, but then it's not, Allah is not looking at the details of slaughter. What does Allah say about the slaughter of the animals in the Quran? Oh, um, it's not the blood, it's not the, the slaughter, uh, it's not the meat and the blood that, that's important that reaches Allah. It's the taqwa, your ability to follow as best as you can without asking too many details. So that's the whole point. These questions, ayyul islami afdal, these are the practical questions, not details of, of practice and how to pray and things like that. Companions did come to learn how to pray, but the Prophet did it and they didn't get into like so many details and Follow up questions with follow up questions. Wallahu alam. You're going to push back. Okay. Arshad, the Hanbali Faqih, is going to take issue. Fadl. Yeah, yeah. The microphone so people can hear. So the defense they would say is, you know, they'll use the hadith that is obviously well known in Arba'i and Nawi. Uh, you know, so very, you know, Yerfa Yadahu, Namini calls Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Mata'um Haram, Mamal Bazar Haram, and Mastajabu Lidarik. They will use that hadith and they'll say, since this person was not careful in how, you know, in the the food that he consumed mm -hmm. and the food that the other clothes that he wore and all of these things. Mm -hmm. So, this is the other side that, you know, the, a Muslim has to be very careful. And the problem is, I don't know if it's a problem or a bad thing. Throughout the books of fiqh, one of the things you'll commonly find is, Al Ihtiyat fi Deen Wajib. Mm -hmm. Which is, I don't think uh, the general statement itself is bad, but this is the mm -hmm. generally. So yeah, excellent pushback. Um, so, but I'm still standing and I want to push back some more. Um, so this is what Shaykh Hakam taught. He's brilliant. He says, um, and he's absolutely right, that the malbasu haram wa matamu haram, that means their the income was in law, law, unlawful. Does, it's not talking about the details of slaughter. So that person who asked, asks Allah and his income is wrong and he's getting haram income and he's, you know, cheating people or engaging in riba, then how could his dua be answered? So it's not about the meat. It's about the income. And that's what the halal and tayyiban means. There's food has to be halal. It has to be lawful that among the categories are law, but it also has to be tayyib means you have to procure it from a um, a major uh, lawful source. So, what does that mean? That means halal income is a core teaching of the faith. There's no compromise there. There, you have to do every ihtiyat. Anything that could possibly be wrong, like it smells of riba, if you're not sure it's riba or not, if you're not sure it's haram, you leave it. Because this is a core teaching of the faith. Allah says, do not engage in riba in the strongest terms. So, having halal income is a core teaching, there's no compromise on that. But then slaughtering an animal is not a core teaching. It is the slaughter itself is a teaching, but it's not in 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 that level of and so in these non-core teachings, you try your best. But there's a lot of flexibility there. And even how could it be a core teaching when there's a difference of opinion about the slaughter among great ulama like Imam Shafri and others? Imam Shafri is no is not no less of an Imam than others. For them, the meat of Ahl al Kitab, you're not supposed to inquire about their slaughter as long as they're Ahl al Kitab. It's understood that is halal. You, I mean, I would disagree. Many of us would disagree, but still, it's something that you have to respect. So, on there, the details always have differences among the fuqaha, and the principle in fiqh is what? La inkar fi masail al ikhtilaf. There is no pushing back on matters of disagreement. So, matters that are peripheral matters, 
there's a lot of disagreements among jurors. They're not matters of fundamental matters of right and wrong. You shouldn't be that strict on that. But the matters of core teachings of the faith, like taqwa, like shirk, like tawheed, like haram and halal, like the, in the major forms, those are very, very important. There's no compromise in that. So that's how we understand everything in a unified whole. Wallahu alam. Okay. So the isnad, let's do the isnad because we're over time, but let me finish the isnad. So this isnad is coming from um, Sa'id ibn Yahya. Sa'id ibn Yahya ibn Sa'id al Qurashi. So he was a great. So this isnad is a Kufan isnad. Everyone is from Kufa. So Sa'id ibn Yahya, he was a great scholar from Kufa. Um, his name was Abu Uthman, Sa'id ibn Yahya ibn Aban ibn Sa'id ibn al As. And Ibn al-As, al-As was the mushrik that was killed in Badr on the wrong side. So Sa'id, it would be his one father, grandfather, great-great-great-grandfather. So Bukhari's teacher, Sa'id, his great-great-grandfather was As, uh, who was As ibn Umayyah ibn Abd shams who was killed in Badr as a mushrik. So all six, except for Ibn Majah, relate from Sa'id ibn Yahya. He was known to be Thiqa, and Nasa'i said him and his father were Thiqa. Ali ibn al-Madini said, huwa athbat min abihi. He was more reliable than even his father. Um, so Sa'id ibn Yahya relates from who? Who's the next person? His father. So, this, so there are two things about this isnad. Number one, it's a Kufan isnad. Number two, it's a family isnad. It tells you a lot. So Kufan is everyone's from Kufa. It's just a historical coincidence. Second, Sa'id ibn Yahya is relating from his father. His father is Yahya ibn Sa'id. So Yahya ibn Sa'id is not the same Yahya ibn Sa'id al-Ansari from Hadith 1. But this is Yahya ibn Sa'id, the descendant of As. So he was a great scholar. He was also reliable. All six uh, books of Hadith have Hadith from him. And he relates from, who's the next person? On the Isnad? Abu Burda. So Abu Burda, his name was Buraid ibn Abdullah ibn Abi Burda ibn Abu Musa of Kufa. So he was a great hadith expert of Kufa. So this Abu Musa is Abu Musa al-Ashari. Okay, so Abu Burda was, the, he died uh, in the year about 140. He was a great expert of hadith in Kufa. He was descendant of Abu Musa. So he relates from who? So who is his, in relation, what is that? Grandfather, yes. So you have, you have uh, the first uh, on top, sorry. So for next week, write this not in the opposite direction. In Islamic tradition, your name comes at the bottom and the messenger's name come on top. So I keep looking on the bottom to go top and we're going the other way around. Um, so Yahya is relating from his father. No, Sa'id. Sa'id is relating from his father. And the father, Yahya, is relating from Abu Burda. Abu Burda. And you can see that from the name. If you look at the Isnad, read the Isnad together. Abu Burda ibn Abdullah ibn Abi Burda. An Abi Burda. So the, Abu Burda is relating from his grandfather. And then the grandfather, Abu Burda, is relating from who? Abu Musa al-Ashri. But what's the relation? That's his father. Okay, that's his father. So Abu Burda, great scholar of Kufa. So this is three generations of Abu Musa al-Ashari's family. The hadith is from Abu Musa al-Ashari. And you can see in the Isnad, is going to his son. Um, and is going through. So Abu Burda ibn Abi Musa, that's his name. So if you go the other way around from the Prophet, it's Abu Musa. Abu Musa relates to his son, and that son related to his grandson. That grandson related to uh, Yahya, and Yahya related to his son. And then Bukhari got from him. Um, jamian. So this is hadith number two. This is kind of like a continuation of the previous hadith, although there's a new chapter created here because it's teaching you something additional. Okay, any questions? And it's 9.30. I think we need to stop. Yeah, let's stop with two hadith.
So I realized we are not going to finish Kitab al Iman this semester. So I I accept that. Yeah. Kitab al Iman is going to go into next semester. Inshallah, we'll try to finish by the next semester. Uh, so we'll divide Kitab al Iman among the two semesters. Inshallah. Any questions? Do you have those 20 pieces of Bukhari somewhere? Yeah, I have them somewhere. Inshallah. There's 20. What do you mean? How many? No, no, he had 200 something teachers. But there's, so the 20, what I mentioned is that there are 20 teachers from whom Imam Bukhari related more than half the Sahih. That's from the research, Sheikh Akram. So half, it's from the rest. There are 200. So there might be a teacher of his, he gets one hadith from. Another teacher gets two hadith from. But there's 20 teachers where he gets majority of his hadith from, or more than 50%. Just tells you that there are 20 teachers he held in high esteem, and then the rest he related here and there. Um, yeah, go ahead. This might fall into fiqh, but uh, no, we'll use the principles that you use. And then um, I'm just trying to ask, because uh, for somebody, you know, let's say, one of the first questions people typically tend to ask uh, when they let's say, when they first become religious, even in the Middle East, is, uh, Sheikh, I work for the IT side, let's say, of a bank or something. Mm -hmm. So, and you mentioned the principle, you know, we're very strict on halal, and there's also an ayah in the Quran, ta'awni al birri wa taqwa wa la ta'awni al ithmi wa la Mm -hmm. The very people that I find uh, who talk about the details of fiqh, and sometimes they tell me they work for the bank in the IT sector. Yeah. Like I just wanted to know what uh, how Akram uh, Sheikh Akram mentioned or tackles this issue because here I've mm -hmm. they obviously they listen to some of the imams and a lot of the imams gave the usul that oh it's fine as long as you're not directly involved. Right. But you are literally the helper of something that is on a foundation level, which is. Obviously, clearly, how on like how does uh, Sheikh Akram uh, answer these? So things? it's a that's very deep, detailed, lengthy discussion that cannot be given justice on like like suppose you work in the IT department for a bank. So Sheikh Akram has answered that he believes it's okay because you're not directly participating in the transactions, and so being in the transaction would be not allowed for him because that's like uh, you're involved in the riba transaction. So. The transaction is not just between there is there is there is people who sign it there are people who witness it there are people who are involved in that process but providing support like an IT support or being a janitor in the bank you're cleaning the bank you know um, so it's not technically uh, direct aid or direct support um, however there is there are a lot of people who would not be comfortable with that and their taqwa would lead them not to do that as well and they would be rewarded for that and that's perfectly fine. So this is where taqwa does help. Um, so there's a there's an answer, a legal answer, and then there's an approach. How are you going to apply that to your life? But this flip side doesn't apply to like the matters of like peripheral matters. So like, you know, suppose you believe, for instance, like I believe when I say Allahu Akbar, I raise my hands, I have to bring my hands to my ear length. And some schools of fiqh, they, they do that. Uh, what do they do in the Hanbali school? Like, ear length or just shoulder length? Okay. Suppose you believe ear length is a sunnah. And then someone does it this way. And if if you're not careful and you don't know how to approach this peripheral versus secondary issues and having a prophetic methodology, that might be something that you consider monkar and you have to command you know, the good and forbid the evil. And you would harshly stop that person from doing this. Because the sunnah is bringing it up to here because you believe that's right. But you have to understand the Prophet ﷺ did not come here to teach us those details. They weren't important to him. That's not one of the core teachings. The core teaching is to make salah, you know, and be having khushur. That's the core teaching that you shouldn't have compromise and that's what you need to focus on. But the peripherals, the Prophet said, raise your hands. The fact that their companions understood it differently and where to place your hands understood it differently, that for many of us would mean, it teaches us that was not important. Those details were not important. They were not as important as the core details. So this is not to say we shouldn't learn them. We learn like how to pray. Of course, you're going to learn a way. You're going to learn from someone. It's going to teach you from a school of thought and, 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 and that's perfectly fine. But you need to understand what are core teachings 
what are peripheral twitching. So remember in Arba'in, I gave the schematic, I'll bring you, I'll see if I can find it. There's the whole deen is divided into usul deen that's the core teaching. Then furur deen furur deen are divided into furur deen al-kubra and furur deen al-sughra. So furur deen al-kubra are salah, zakah. They're important. So this is from Shah Waliullah and these holistic scholars. So the core teaching will be taqwa, or dhikr. Aqib salata li dhikri. When Allah says that aqib salata li dhikri, establish the prayer to remember me. In this verse, we learn that dhikr is the core teaching, usul al-deen. Then the salah is furur din kubra, a major branch of faith. It's important, but it's a branch of faith. A branch of deen, rather. And then furur din al-sughra are the minor details. You know, like exact details of like wudu, how, how many times to wash your, that's a sughra. So we supposed to focus on usul al-deen in our teaching and furur din al-kubra. And the more you go down that spectrum, the more flexibility there is. And the more higher you get up, there's more or less flexibility. Then there's certain matters that take priority, like eating haram, riba. In the usul al-deen, that takes a higher priority because there's a principle of fiqh where prohibitions have priority over the commands. In other words, you work on prohibitions first, like involved in haram, that's more of a priority for you to get rid of that haram than to do the obligation. Not to mean the obligation is not important and you have to do them. You don't have to do Of course you have to do them. But if you're involved in shirk, for instance, then your salah will not be count. So you have to work on the shirk part, get rid of that, that's the prohibition. Same thing with eating haram. So that's very, very serious. That's why scholars are very strict on that. If anything smelled of riba, they would leave it. Anything smells of zina, you leave it. That's why they're so strict on these matters. But the peripheral matters of filth, they're not that strict about. Allahu A'lam. Any questions on the Isnad or the previous hadith? I have a question on hadith. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hadith 10. Hello, so I wanted to understand um, other narrators like uh, Imam Muslim, did they narrate that hadith? Which hadith are you talking about? The last one? Uh, the previous one, uh, hadith number 10, where we had the long discussion about the three chains. Oh, so Muslim does not narrate it. He narrates a different version that's uh, very similar. Oh, okay. But it's not this particular, it's not. He doesn't, he doesn't accept this, it's not. Because of, uh, he, he believes Sharbi did not hear. Or in his judgment, this evidence wasn't strong enough, so he just left that out. That is not out. So which yeah. is not what he preferred then? So he has different is not from other companions, and the versions are slightly different. Um, so they're they're right here. I can um so while I look it up, is there's another question? I'll I'll re I can read you the other portion of that inshallah. I'm uh, trying to find yeah, it. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, if there was one that was less controversial, then why wouldn't Bukhari just use that and call it a day? Okay, because of the courage of Bukhari. So you missed the whole point. So a weak person when he sees cowardice when weak or cowardly person or someone doesn't have the skill set to resolve a problem when he sees controversy he'll leave it so that approach does not always work oh there's a controversy about it let's leave it the real scholar those who have courage and those who have that skill set they get into it they say i want to find out what the truth is once you find out what the truth this hadith is fully acceptable for him why should he leave it for him the prophet said it it's not as solid but to prove to others he's bringing and supporting it's not look this is some of the reasons why i believe this it's not as acceptable for bukhari it wasn't controversial it's kind of like you know ibn Taymiyyah's discussion on the mutashabihat of the quran right like the quran says there are ayat that are clear and there are ayat that are mutashabihat people of disease in the heart they follow the mutashabihat so ibn Taymiyyah says mutashabihat is relative because for some people a verse that's not clear to another person is clear to one person when it's clear to you, you can't leave that verse because, oh, there's a dispute about it. No. If you're certain in your heart of hearts that it's, you know this is what it means, or that the Prophet said this hadith, then you would use it. Bukhari used it. So he was bold. You can say he was bold and he was academic, and um, but Muslim was more careful and cautious. So if there's even like a semblance of someone has bid'ah, he would be more inclined to reject their hadith uh, based on that feature. So you can take your approach. 
you can pick uh, which approach suits you, but there are differences of opinions among experts. But you need to appreciate at least what Bukhari is doing. It's not that he's taking controversial things. He's settling the controversy and he's removing the controversy. Right. Well, uh, so quick follow-up. So we can say then that he's, you know, he's daring enough to do this. That's quite clear. But then he's also teaching us that there's a, there's a methodology to sort through these things. You don't have to just run away from them. You can apply more due diligence and and clarify them. Yeah, exactly. So the it's matter kind of, of the contrary, it's kind of like a lesson to, really get into that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like a whole lesson to due diligence when you look at yes, it from the absolutely. background. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not, not everyone doesn't have the skill set, right? Everyone's not going to be able to do that, right? right? You know. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I mean, you, some, some, some matters you can't leave it. You have to do something. Like you're faced with something. You have to do take make a choice. You don't have the luxury to leave everything. Then, um, so sometimes you do have to get into it. And sometimes people are involved in job situations. For me, for one person who's looking for jobs, and you know he has to choose among jobs. There has to be more careful, right? Then they should be more careful and be more certain and try to be uh, err on the safe side. Another person is involved in a job. That's his job. That's his livelihood. Now he comes to a realization. He wants to know what to do. Maybe he wasn't practicing before. Now he is. His situation is different now. The mufti would look at his situation. Now, slightly different approach for that person. Now you help him out in that situation. Give him a way out. If you just say it's haram, then that person's out of the job. And then he's homeless and his kids are on the street. And then they're begging for money in the masjid. And that's haram. That's not a good thing. So you have to look at the whole scenario. It's so like the mufti, the, the fatwa process is very, very uh, sophisticated. It depends on the person as well. So this hadith, uh, let me see. Anyone else have questions while I'm looking for it? Is there a reason why, um, I mean, generally when, when it comes to uh, Imam Muslim and Imam Bukhari, it's, the condition is as long as there's let's let's just say I know you don't agree with Zofi. In Kana Lika, you know, for sure they met also in it's actually meeting both conditions. Mm -hmm. So why would uh, you know Imam Muslim still reject something? I mean, I, I'm trying to understand like did he have a reason for him to reject this because because so, they have met and from that itself you can assume that they he would have narrated. Okay, so so here so Shahakar makes this point. That imkan al liqa. So there's that's not a proper condition that people misunderstand. So the scholars were not looking at just the possibility of them being contemporary. That wasn't enough. So that I mean that is there, but they also looked at other factors. So the other so one is that they're contemporaries. Second factor they also looked at is like is there any proof that they didn't meet? In this case, there is proof that they possibly didn't meet because there's an isnad that says an Sharbi and Rajul and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Allah. So there exists some proof to the contrary that there's an extra person in between the chain. That means possibly he did not meet him. So that's another factor they were looking at, not just imkan and liqa. And the third factor they were looking at, even there's liqa and even there's sama between the two individuals. This person heard hadith from this person, but then hadith nafsuhu. What about the hadith? And Ibn Hajar talks about this. They looked at this particular report that that person hear. So that's something, if there's there's possibility or there's some evidence that, yes, this person heard 100 hadith from this teacher, but he didn't hear this hadith. So they looked at that all as well. And at the end of the day, this is very uh, sophisticated historical analysis, and there will be differences of opinion. That's natural, right? Not everyone's going to have the same uh, opinion on matters. Uh, coming back to this hadith, um, so, Badruddin al Aini, his Umdatul um, Qari is a remarkable book. Um, is a Sharaf of Sahih Bukhari. So, every hadith, he gives you all the names in the chain. He gives you like some benefits, Lata'iful Isnad. And then at the end, he gives you other riwayat. So, it, it's a little beyond Ibn Hajar. Um, but in the middle, most of the explanations are plagiarized from Ibn Hajar. Um, but there's a lot of benefit here. He adds some things that Ibn Hajar doesn't necessarily have. So he says this hadith, Muslim and Salim al Muslimun min lisani wa yadihi, appears in Sahih al Bukhari um, in a number of places. But 
this particular it's not this particular version only Bukhari has it not Muslim but Muslim has Ba'dahu fi sahihi an Jabir Muslim relates to hadith from Jabir and the hadith has a Muslimu man salim al muslimun min lisanihi wa yadihi but he doesn't have the hij hijra part so he just has this portion and then he also has a hadith um, from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al as that a man asked the messenger of Allah ayyul muslimun khair which Muslims are the best and he answered, Man salim al muslimun min lisanihi wa yadihi. So it's in different versions in Bukhari, in Muslim, but this exact isnad with this particular full hadith is not in Muslim. So he didn't accept this exact isnad. So for most of us, we would say, well, it's the same hadith. So a lot of times people will say related by Bukhari and Muslim because they're looking at the meaning of the hadith. If you look at the meaning of the hadith, not the exact hadith, then yes, it's in Bukhari and Muslim, but these scholars were looking at you know the wordings of the reports and looking at the isnad remember for muhaddithin each isnad is an independent hadith even if his matan was the same so allahu alam and then nisa'i says nisa'i has the wording man hajara ma harram allahu alayhi so nisa'i has the same wording as bukhari but slightly different and then he says in mustadrak slightly different the hadith says wal mu'minu man aminahu nas Prophet said, the mu'min is the one from whom other people are safe. He's playing off the word mu'min. So that's in the mustadrak of al-hakim. So there's all these different versions of the, the hadith itself, coming from various isnads and different companions. But the strongest versions are in Bukhari and Muslim. That's what we should try to stick to. And this is that discussion. Allahu a'lam. Any other questions online? So is this considered muttafaqun alayhi? So that's the question. No. Technically, no, because the hadith is different in Muslim, although it has similar wording. Had he had man hajra, you know, uh, the hijra part in the same hadith with the same companion, then maybe. So, but if, you, if you're, if you again, muttafaqun alayhi, what do you mean by that? It depends on whoever is me. If you mean, broadly speaking, the broad contours of the hadith is in Muslim as well. Then you can make an argument and say, I believe it's in Bukhari and Muslim when you give a khutbah, for instance, you don't want to get into that nuance in the khutbah. But technically speaking, no. But you can make an argument and use that term in your own way. Yeah, so the explanation where they're going to come from, they're going to come from the Messenger of Allah. So, so you know, like the hadith in the Arba'in, we did that class last week, where Rasima minni dima'uhum wa amwalahum. The Prophet created this protected space in the community of believers. So it doesn't mean that outside the protected space you're allowed to kill everyone. It just means this per, per space of believers, as they say, La ilaha illallah, umirtu an uqatil al nas, hatta yashadu an la ilaha illallah, and the Muhammad Rasulullah. Wa ida fa'alu dhali, asamu minni dima'uhum wa amwalahum illa bihaqil islam. So this explains to you that protected space concept where now you're in this protected space. You testify to live by these laws within the space and you believe in Allah and His Messenger, you're protected, your blood and your property is protected. But then, illa bi haqqil Islam. It's not an absolute protection. There might be scenarios where, you know, that harm for the greater good would allow it to be instant. For instance, if you take wealth from your neighbor unjustly. So now, if you're a Muslim, just because you're a believer, your wealth would not be protected. You stole it. So the authority and the ruler, and the, they can get involved and forcibly take that property back from you. And you might say, you're not allowed to say that you're harming my property. Well, no, you took it from someone else and now you have to endure this temporary harm for that greater good. So. Yeah, you have to look at the entirety of the deen and the sunnah.
Yeah, but so the tax is, it doesn't take away from us recognizing, affirming it's the most unjust system because like Islam gives you 2.5% of, of your savings here. It's not savings. So you could be dirt poor, but you got to give a portion of it to the government. And then the other side of that, where does it go? It goes to Israel. $5 billion a year. That's most of our taxes. A portion of our taxes funding the destruction of another people. Or abortion, all sorts of things, yeah. So it is an evil institution it's of the highest proportions. And the Islamic norms is not to the ruler to tax people beyond their scope. It's very minimal. Islam is very minimal. People have the right to keep what they earn. And, and Islam gives the moral encouragement to help others in need and create this circumstances we're forced to be taking it it's not even for charities for and the government is a deeply uh, bureaucratic deep state that sustains itself there's a whole military industrial complex in every country not just the a group of people there to make your life better it's a it's a whole institution that exists and needs to feed off on others to keep existing and keep growing tremendous corruption in those state institutions so it's it needs a whole rethink, but you know I'm not saying don't pay your taxes, but uh, well let me press stop the record button then I can say hang on, uh, stop.